Hello lovely people. In today's video, why are you an 8 in one shop, a 14 in another, and a 0 if you're in the United States? Why isn't there a universal sizing standard? Well, there is indeed a reason for the sizing madness and we'll be going through the history today as well as reintroducing you to today's sponsor, Zizili. I say reintroducing you because I am such a huge fan of this Malaysian lingerie brand that I've talked about them basically every time I talk about my chest area or bras or bodies. <laughs> I was first introduced to their bras while I was out in Malaysia in 2016. I loved them so much that I ditched every bra I own and replaced them with Zizzly ones when I went out in 2018 and I've just been hanging on, um, waiting to get back there in order to get new ones. But um, yeah, this little thing called a pandemic happened. But good news, they now ship internationally to the US and the UK. Yes. Oh, hello. Let's talk underwear. Zizli is a homegrown Malaysian company that makes beautiful, fashionable lingerie that, shocker, actually feels good and easy to wear. Now, when it comes to uncomfortable underwear, trust that I know what I'm talking about. I have a disability that affects my nerves and means that I don't get sensory feedback particularly quickly. It also means that when injured, my nerves can, instead of sending pain signals, just kind of decide to stop working and content warning, skip to this number on screen, screamish people. Sometimes this happens if I'm wearing an uncomfortable bra and I won't be able to tell even when the bra cuts into my skin enough for it to start bleeding. Yes, I have scars from ill-fitting bras. I even currently have some blisters that I'm covering up with a plaster. Mmm. So imagine my relief when my new Zizli bras arrived in the post. They are so well cut and with just the right amount of stretch they mould to my scoliosis and give my chest a great lift without any pain. Look at this wonderful strap. It is all stretch and no dangerous elastic at the top and bottom cutting in. The comfort level here is ridiculous. This is one of their wireless bras that they're really well known for. It's actually made of molded foam and it's like a cloud cupping your breast in the most supportive way possible. Their brand motto is uplifting you always and as someone with a small chest but proportionally larger cup size, I can say it really works for me. Their sizes go from a double A to an I and bands go from 65 centimeters to 100 centimeters and they have different cuts intended to suit all shapes and sizes. Do you like a more solid cup here with a bit of uplift at the side? Sides. Oh yes, quite the bra for you. Are you a fan of an underwire, flexible underwire of course, a looser cup? Obviously this little beauty is the one for you. She's actually really comfy this one. Inner support is something that's really wonderful because not only are you being cupped at the bottom but also this little side cup area here. I just, I can't rave enough about these, okay? Just the comfort, the comfort level without it feeling like it's dragging down across your shoulders and across your back is something that I don't normally experience with a bra. A 28 double D, it's quite hard to find good bras. For unfun fact, 80% of women are wearing the wrong bra size. Don't do that. Don't let that be you. Try out the 3D avatar on Zizli's website instead and see what works for your unique body shape. Finding a correct bra can be incredibly overwhelming. How do you know you're even wearing the right size? Well, follow Shishali's how to measure guide and size chart and you might just be surprised at the results. After all, a UK 38E is European 85F and an Australian 16E, which in Italy is a 4F, but a Japanese 85G and a French 100G, but also an American 38 triple D slash F? I mean, I'm already lost. So yes, if you're already sure of your size, then check out their international conversion charts. And if you're really just uh, not sure about anything, they have amazing customer service via chat and email who are able to converse in a range of languages. But again, I'm really gonna promote the uh, how to measure yourself guide because it's great and it really helped me. Click the link in my description to head to their website and try it out today. I am sure you will see why I love them so much. Oh my gosh, and also you should definitely check out their nightwear. I love it. <clears throat> Back to me with my clothes on. In the not too distant past, long before vanity sizing created the need for clothing size conversion charts, or did it? Apparel was handmade for the wearer. Clothes were generally produced in the home until the 19th century and a garment was intended to last for a very long time. Whilst today we purchase a piece of clothing, wear it a few times and toss it, the creation, production and distribution of clothing is the fourth largest manufacturing business in the world and it produces an estimated 92 million tonnes of waste a year. Yeah. Every single second around the world, the equivalent of one rubbish truck of textiles is dumped or burnt. Oh, well now I'm in a misery spiral, so I'm not going to do anything about this. Mm. Am I about to tell you that this is all the fault of ready-to-wear garments? That you're a terrible human being for not sewing all of your own clothes? Past generations, good. Current generations, bad. 
Deep breaths, deep breaths, it's okay, it's okay. Well, actually, archeological records show that merchants in ancient Babylonia shipped and distributed some ready-to-wear garments as early as 1400 BCE. In ancient Rome, garments were produced in workshops of up to 100 workers to outfit the military, and it was more than a millennium later that the need for military uniforms again brought forward a revolution in garment production, this time in sizing, which is how we come to today's title. You have been measured incorrectly your whole life. I know. Welcome to a very Eurocentric history of size guides. <laughs> Pre-1900, the earliest records resembling contemporary measurement standards date back to the Middle Ages. Prior to this, clothes were often loose and made of wrapped fabric, thus didn't require a great deal of tailoring or size guidelines. After 1350, clothing became much more form-fitting, and a small cottage industry for ready-to-wear items emerged, producing shirt accessories such as detachable sleeves and collars, as well as gloves and hats. A cottage industry is a business or manufacturing activity that's carried out in people's homes, so literally, in their cottages. This was before the Industrial Revolution, so most textile and garment production was on a very small scale in home workshops or on kitchen tables or people's laps. Merchants dropped off raw materials to the workers' homes where production relied on self-pacing and included low or highly skilled work. Which can we just say, by the way, is really great to work around your childcare. Brilliant if you have like 15 children. From the second half of the 16th century, gloves, stockings, collars and hats were imported and exported in bulk quantities. We are still, however, only talking about accessories. Garments themselves were still being made individually, and if not done at home, then needed to be ordered in advance and to precise custom measurements, meaning that they were generally available to a very limited number of wealthy people. Following an incredibly thorough measuring session, a tailor would pattern, cut, and assemble each item from scratch. A huge amount of work, and thus it isn't surprising that the clothes ordered were expected and designed to last. In the early 19th century, tailors decided to start making their own and their colleagues' lives easier by sharing patterns, only to find that it, uh, it really didn't, since no one had a cohesive sizing plan. They all used a disarray of metric systems, and often had just a lack of standardization of sizing altogether. Oh golly. Don't worry though, then there was a war. I mean, that's guaranteed to advance technological development. A demand for a large quantity of military uniforms to be made far away from the front lines and the men who would be wearing them meant that there had to be a degree of standardization when it came to sizing. You look like you're a medium. Here's a jacket. This is a small. I didn't say it was a perfect system. A full body sizing system was developed, making it possible to calculate other parameters based on a single chest measurement. Once this mass production of uniforms was in place, there was a transformation in the production of ready-made clothing for the man on the street, and by the end of the 19th century, the vast majority of urban male population in Europe and North America were wearing mass-produced, standardized clothing. Yay for men. Women's wear, however, continued to be, uh, complicated. Largely thanks to these. Oops, making everything more complicated since ever. Variations in breast and hip sizes are difficult to reduce to a single number, but the biggest challenge is always the bust shape. The three-dimensional differences in size and the proportional differences between waist and bust measurements amongst different women is pretty darn difficult to account for. As you can imagine, when it comes to taking measurements of a man's chest, there are considerably fewer needed than a woman's chest, which requires about 11 different measurements to cope with having these two mounds on your chest. And if you're someone like me with a double scoliosis and asymmetrical body, then you're going to need a lot more measurements. So, women's wear continued to be made in dressmakers' workrooms and at home, with any sizes that were used for patterns being given complex coded numbers and letters corresponding to bust, waist, hip, and height measurements, rather than the men's clothing sizes, which are primarily defined in terms of body measurements based on chest size. Victorian clothes. Moving into the Victorian era, the invention of steam-powered machines for producing textiles and clothing revolutionized the industry and, um, <clears throat> ruined the lives of the workers. Textile and garment work became increasingly fast-paced and mechanized, requiring fewer skilled people and less individuality. Does this sound familiar? No more were they craftspeople, now mere cogs in the corporate wheel. Large mills and factories produced petticoats, shirts, trousers, gloves, hats, and footwear. On the factory floor, women and children worked 12-hour days, extending to 20 hours in the busy months, for poverty wages. Children who fell asleep from this gruelling work were beaten or fined. The floating fibres caused respiratory problems for workers, dim light ruined their eyesight, and toxic dyes poisoned them. Oh, but don't worry. English lawmakers enacted some of the earliest labour standards in 1833. So don't panic, everyone. Children can now only work for 8 hours a day 
day. And those under nine can't even work in mills and factories, so you know, whoop whoop. Oh, you can still put a four-year-old to work on the railway or the coal mines or a farm though, so don't panic. They weren't going soft. Women's dresses and other fitted garments were not included in the output of this proliferation of ready-to-wear garment factories, and many items of clothing were still handmade, tailored for the wearer. Wealthy and upper middle class women took samples of fashion illustrations to a seamstress. Think of, you know, skimming through Vogue, liking what you see, and then having it replicated exactly. Let's ignore the fact that there's probably a pop-up ad for that very service in this video right now. Do not click on it. You know the quality won't be good and they've just stolen the picture from somewhere else. Don't do it! The women of this time who were rich enough to afford visiting a tailor were likely to have non-standard body measurements, a result of years of wearing corsets from a young age, and so the size patterns used to make garments for them were not representative of human populations at large and could not be scaled out to sell ready-to-wear to the greater public as had been done with men. Which is fascinating, right? Your parents' income very much did have a lasting impact on your body shape in a variety of ways. It also had an impact on whether you were one of three or one of twelve, which would also have had an impact on your parents' pocket which would also have had an impact on your education, which would also have had an impact on your... Whoa, 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 okay, okay, we get it, we get it. The Victorian era is depressing. Could we just try to do better now, please? <laughs> Although factory-produced fabrics were affordable and available, easy-to-use dress patterns and sewing machines for the home seamstress were not. So everyone making their clothes at home became deeply acquainted with their own unique measurements. The earliest sewing patterns for the public were published in books, trade magazines, journals, and other periodicals. Full-size pattern sheets suitable for tracing were sometimes included in women's periodicals from around 1770 on. From the 1830s, on, shops in England advertised paper sewing patterns for sale, initially for professional dressmakers, but also available for home sewers. Multiple publications that included pattern drafts were launched in England and France during the 1850s and 1860s. The English Women's Domestic Magazine began including patterns as supplements in 1860 and also offered them through mail order. In order to size the garment, the closest size pattern was selected and alterations were made to the pattern where a person's measurements differed from standard measurements. It sounds easy, right? I mean, well, maybe. When you're talking about a man's shirt that's made from not that many pieces of fabric and it's just a basic square shape. Uh, but absolutely not when it comes to women's Whilst it was possible to buy one well-tailored men's jacket and take it apart in order to obtain a basic model pattern that could be braided, proportionally increased in size, and altered to shape and fit, women's fashion was not so fast to abandon its close body-fitting style, which then delayed the developing of sizing systems ready to wear clothing, and meant that with the absence of stretch fabrics, you are going to need to let your dress out every time you put on a few pounds. How were our great-grandmothers so casually great at sewing? Oh, because they weren't offered any other career options? You don't say! The first major manufacturer to offer tissue paper sewing patterns in graduated sizes was Ebenezer Butterick, a Massachusetts tailor. Butterick launched the Butterick Company in 1863 to create heavy cardboard templates for children's clothing. Butterick's innovation was offering every pattern in a series of standard graded sizes. Members of his family cut and folded the first patterns that were sold in their home. In 1866, Butterick began manufacturing patterns for women's fashions and later added some articles of men's clothing. They began publishing the fashion magazine The Delineator in 1873 to publicize their patterns. The patterns started as unprinted tissue paper cut to shape, folded and held together by a pinned or later pasted on label with an image and later brief instruction. Between 1908 and 1913, Paris fashions finally moved away from the corseted figure and a more natural shape began to make way for the development of affordable, ready-to-wear women's clothing. Women's attitudes towards wearing ready-made clothing also began to change and it was accepted as a smarter form of dressing. So British manufacturers put their heads together and came up with an easy to understand system of measurement that made sizing easy for customers. No, of course they didn't. Every company had conflicting and confusing charts with two inch margins of error in the bust, waist and hips as they all went for kind of like an average size. Sort of think of those clothes that say fits all but in small, medium and large. The codes for sizes were complex and less like one, two and three and more like SW, OS, XOS, XXOS, EOS, SOS, SOS indeed. So the British Standards Institution received a royal charter in 1929 and the first standard to provide body measurements, BS1445, was introduced in the midst of a national drive for societal and physical improvement of the general population. The clothing 
Industry Development Council was apparently concerned about the scale of alterations done on ready-to-wear clothing made after purchase. I mean, <laughs> if only consumer complaints were taken so seriously today. Over in the USA, the government had also decided it was time to get the sizing issue on track. And in 1939, funded statistician, funded statistician, statistician, stat, people who do statistics to collect weight measurements and 58 different size measurements from 15,000 women with the hope that certain key measurements would predict other body measurements. But um, <clears throat> even though women of all colors turned up to be measured and they took those measurements, they only used the white women's measurements in the study. Yes. The freaking body measurement chart uh, that we've all used forever um, is based on just one distinct group of people yet is meant to apply to all. I don't know that any of us are shocked by this revelation. History. Surprisingly racist. Secondly, the women who were paid for their participation in the study were largely from the poor end of society and suffering from malnourishment. So the clothing industry made a sizing chart based on underweight white women and then expected us all just to squeeze right in. And, speaking of squeezing, vanity sizing. Here's a chart that illustrates the absurdity of women's clothing sizes. A US size 8 dress today is nearly the equivalent of a size 16 dress in 1958. And a size 8 dress of 1958 um, doesn't actually have a modern day equivalent. The waist and bust measurements of the Mad Men era 8 come in smaller than today's size double zero. These measurements come from official sizing standards once maintained by the National Bureau of Standards, now the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and taken over in recent years by the American Society of Testing Materials. Blah, blah, blah. That was a lot of names. Those statisticians who measured the 15,000 women were the first to propose the nation arbitrary numerical sizes that weren't based on any specific measurement, kind of similar to shoe size. The US government published body measurements for the sizing of women's patterns and apparel in 1958 with the intention of providing the consumer with a means of identifying her body type and size from the wide range of body types covered and enable her to be fitted properly by the same size regardless of price, type of apparel or manufacturer of the garment. Uh-huh, yeah, that really worked. The standard included the first modern women's clothing size chart, and it provides the first data points in the charts above. Women's sizes ranged from 8 to 42. A size 8 woman had a bust of 31 inches, a 23.5 inch waist, and a weight of 98 pounds. A 23.5 inch waist. I think I had that waist when I started primary school, to be honest. But manufacturers were not inclined to pay attention. After all, their clients might not even be properly represented by these so-called standards. What if their shop catered mainly to non-white clientele who had a different body shape to the one the government insisted was the norm? What if they were a fancy high-end shop and their customers were not, you know, starving, but also didn't want the higher numbers listed on their clothes? So they made the higher sizes, but just, you know, wrote the lower numbers on. Enter the era of so-called vanity sizing. Clothing manufacturers realized that they could flatter the customers by revising sizes downwards. By 1983, the government ditched the standard completely. Manufacturers were left to define sizes as they saw fit. The measurements that added up to Marilyn Monroe's size 12 body in 1958 would get redefined to a size 6 by 2011, and different manufacturers defined sizes themselves differently as well. This New York Times graphic from 2011 shows how a size 8 waist measurement can differ by as much as 5 inches of cloth between different designers. So, spoiler, <laughs> it's not women's vanity that made the size numbers change, um, it's just that we're not malnourished and wizened from childhood diseases anymore. The teeny tiny vintage body type isn't the norm now and that's a good thing. And this is not to say that clothing companies haven't caught on to the marketing possibilities of taking advantage of consumer body image aspirations, downgrading size labels and adding lower numbers like two, zero and later even double zero, which means that, you know, if you're a Brit buying for an American company, you'll either get a little confused as you find yourself suddenly swimming in clothes that say they should fit because our sizes haven't really changed. <laughs> if you're short, tall, or in any way idiosyncratically shaped, then you've definitely dealt with a great deal of frustration when buying or trying on clothes recently. We can't blame manufacturers entirely for ignoring these standards, since the American Society of Testing Materials um, charges for access to its sizing tables. Hmm. So yes, not super surprising that no one's jumping to use them. Let's just make our own. So women are left to navigate the chaos of arbitrary sizing all on their own. So much for enabling women to be fitted properly by the same size, regardless of price, type of apparel, or manufacturer of the garment, as the government's 1958 standard loftily envisaged. 
Which is not to mention the drama of metric versus imperial. The government did a full on, we're switching to metric, only measure yourself in centimetres campaign in the 70s and that did not go well. One interesting study I found was the Textile Clothing Technology Corporation conducted the first widespread study of American women's bodies, called Side USA, recently. They scanned the bodies of almost 11,000 people between the ages of 18 and 80 in 13 locations across the country. The study identified nine distinct body shapes for women, and the hourglass ideal that has long set the standard for women's clothing sizes in fact only rings true for 8% of American women. 8%! And yet that's the shape that we cut most clothes to fit? That's ridiculous. Analogous surveys were conducted in the UK, size UK, South Korea, size Korea, and Mexico, size Mexico. Drop the names of your favourite diverse shapewear clothing brands in the description who cater to more than just the hourglass. In today's world, fashion is online. Brand retailers have to cater to the whole world in all of its diversity, so they tend to focus on certain demographics and hone in on what sells best with them. As a result, different brands owned by the same corporation will often have inconsistent sizes, and add to that the different sizing systems between countries and other regional peculiarities, and the resulting situation is one of complete confusion. For instance, based on international sizing charts for women with an average height of 164 centimeters, a clothing size of 14 in the US corresponds to a 16 in the UK, 44 in France, 42 in Germany, and 48 in Italy. It becomes clear that knowing your clothing size is virtually impossible. And that's where personal recommendations come in, which is why I really love being able to share socially with you today, because it is one of my absolute favourite. I have some issues with, with bras. <laughs> they have literally scarred me. A good bra is very important. Make sure you get good bras, especially if you have EDS. So make sure that you're sharing in the comments below your favourite size aware brands. Give some shout outs to some small companies. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you next time.